Okay, so good afternoon and welcome back. So this is the uh, Promises and Perils of Artificial Intelligence, part two. And just a quick reminder what we did uh, in part one. I talked about what is AI and how machine learning is part of AI and deep learning is part of machine learning. And I talked about the chronology, so the fact that AI is not new, it has been around since the 50s. Um, I also talked about why it's coming back now, of course. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that we have three important factors that happen at the same time. The fact that we have a lot of data, collecting a lot of data. The fact that computers today are incredibly powerful compared to what we used to have before. And also the fact that we devised new uh, powerful algorithms. Um, and then I talk about examples and I give some more details. And, but we stopped just before the examples I wanted to give about precision health. So this is where I'm starting now. What can we do with this AI in the context of medicine? Well, um, in medicine today, uh, typically what you have, you have people coming with symptoms, you do diagnostic, or they have this disease, boom, you give them a treatment. But you put them all in the same group, they're all the same. They have the same symptoms, take this pill. But that's wrong because they're all different. So the idea is to personalize medicine, personalize healthcare. Um, yeah, they have the same symptoms, but they are different. So if I can distinguish between the different groups and uh, know how they actually uh, respond to these treatments, I can give them different treatments that personalized. Uh, ideally, you want to personalize to the individual, but even if we, got, if we personalize it to the cohorts, that's already a huge step forward. And um, my claim is that machine learning that I talked about um, on Tuesday can help do that. Okay. Remember, machine learning is about uh, uh, providing means to the computer to learn from data so that it can adapt to new data coming to it. Uh, if I have enough data that tells me who responds to what treatment, I can give it to a computer the computer learns a predictive model and predict which treatment fits in which person, if I know which person fits in which group. Okay. And that's exactly uh, the example that I'll show you. Um, and that's true not just for treatments, but also doing diagnostic or even prognostic, how the, the disease will uh, develop in the future. Okay. It doesn't develop the same way from one person to the other, even though they started with the same symptoms. Um, <clears throat> often, when we talk about personalized medicine, people think about um, uh, genomics, uh, proteomics, and, and well, microarray data analysis, or uh, SNPs, and things like that. Yes, that's true, but it's not the only kind of data I can use to personalize medicine. And I'll show you some examples. So now the definition encompasses way more than just genetics and omics in general. Um, so, how is it done? i give you an example, high-level example. I have a new patient coming, and that patient has some data. Okay? I have information about that patient, different kind of information, the age, uh, whatever, stuff that I did from the lab uh, tests. <coughs> I may have treated her already, but I want to know, will this particular disease reoccur or not? Will it happen again? Whatever that disease is. Well, how can I do this prediction? I can look at the history. Not the history of this patient, but the history of my clinic, or my hospital, my province, my country, whatever. The data that I have about people, other patients who have the same disease, and I know whether, for them, it's reoccurred or not. Okay. So this becomes my label that I need to predict. Remember the example I showed you with the colors? Okay. So this is what I need to predict. And I have the same kind of uh, um, variables as this patient. The only thing I don't have about this patient is whether it will reoccur or not. So I can build a model, a predictive model from the history and learn, that's my experience for the machine, it builds this 
model here, and then I will use this model to predict for this patient whether it will make or not. Okay, in this case, no. Does it make sense? Okay. So I can do it for many different things. So here's another example. So all these examples that I'll show you are real examples that we worked on here at U of A. Um, and many of the slides will actually give you the uh, reference for the paper. <clears throat> so the case of um, adjuvant treatment uh, after chemotherapy for uh, breast cancer. Okay, this, uh, <clears throat> I have a patient, uh, we did a biopsy to see whether there is uh, cancer or not, but I can use that uh, data also to do gene expressions, uh, study that with the microarray data, and I have other patients in the past that um, I also uh, treated and I also did the uh, microarray data analysis for them. Okay, so I can um, build a classifier to learn from the previous patients, knowing that they have, for example, a, a, a estrogen receptive positive or negative. Uh, I can build this predictive model, and for this particular patient, I will predict whether she's ER positive or negative, and knowing that, I will have uh, a different treatment, hormonal therapy, so this is a, a, an adjuvant treatment after chemotherapy. So I'm personalizing the, um, the treatment based on the patient. And this technique is actually way better than the current techniques that we have in terms of accuracy. Um, the same thing can be done for um, who will actually pre uh, develop uh, breast cancer in the future, yes, no, or predict whether it will reoccur, yes, no. I can also use it for uh, predicting whether a particular patient will reject this transplant or no, or has a higher probability to reject it than somebody else. I can use that uh, to come up with some policies. Um, um, prostate cancer, predicting the toxicity level, I can actually talk about that later. Uh, for cancer decaxia, so this is the uh, lo loss of uh, muscle mass. And we do that either with macroarray data or with SNPs. And I said in the beginning, it's not just that that we can use, and I'll show you all the examples, but this is actually very, very uh, useful indeed for uh, precision health. Um, but here in this case, I'm using another kind of information. So nuclear uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, this is using, for example, a urine sample. Uh, it can be other, other things like from the blood. Um, and uh, you get that signature for the person, okay? A profile, meta metabolomic uh, uh, profile, and you can also use that to build a classifier that predicts, in this particular case, is the capsule yes or no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but we can use the same idea with uh, um, these um, urine tests, for example, and the, the uh, nuclear uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy for uh, treatment, for uh, diagnostic, even for prognostic. Another example, this has nothing to do with microarray data, it has nothing to do with the techniques that I showed before. This is the case of uh, type 1 diabetes. So somebody here yeah. works on type 1 diabetes. So um, it's completely different than uh, type 2 diabetes. So these are people who uh, have to inject themselves the insulin. And uh, typically what happens is that they go and see the doctor once every, they're lucky every three months or every six months, um, and they bring with them their, their log, and they say, okay, uh, that day I, I uh, injected this much, and I, when I measured my, uh, my blood, I have this, and so forth. Okay? And they show this to the doctor, and then the doctor will say, ah, I think you have to adjust the, the amount and from now on use this. And then six months later, they'll do the same thing again. Um, we, I mean, everybody knows that that's not the right thing to do, but we don't have enough people to, to do for every single person. Um, so the idea is that because the dosage that you inject depends upon the physical activity they have that day, how much they ate, what did they eat, and all that stuff. So it's really it's not something for the six months. Okay? It's every day is different. Uh, I, mean, I, I, had a, I had a father who had type 1 diabetes. The days he reads, he actually uh, eats more and, and has a different, different kind of insulin that, 
when a different amount of insulin that he injects himself. Um, <clears throat> but not everybody uh, was able to do it like my dad, so the, the, the way it happens is as I described. So the idea is to have, um, I'll put them all together there, uh, use reinforcement learning. Remember I talked about reinforcement learning on Tuesday? So uh, this is another paradigm for learning. It's like a child learning by giving them a reward when they do something right and uh, uh, you don't give them the reward when they do it wrong or a negative reward and they try and, and, and fail, try and fail until they, they go to the path that actually uh, gives the best reward. They learn a policy, what is the best action to take in order to maximize my, my reward. And we use the same idea here where uh, you the, the action is to change the dosage. And, and the reward, you get it when actually the insulin level, when you do the, uh, uh, the, you check the sugar level in the blood is actually perfect. So you automatically learn to balance it properly. Yeah. And, and, and that is done by, by a machine. Okay. Um, here's another example. So this example doesn't use any data from uh, SNPs or microarray data. So there's no gene expressions, nothing. Here's another example where I have no gene expressions whatsoever, and I'm using machine learning in maps. This is the case of the workers' compensation board when people are injured at work, and they go for treatment, whether they broke a leg or injured their elbow or whatever. <coughs> There's a treatment done in the clinics of the workers' compensation board, and immediately after the treatment, they are evaluated. Are they ready to go back to work? Or no, we need to do something else. Okay? And often you have an iteration. So you have the injury, you have the treatment, you have an evaluation, a second treatment, you have an evaluation, and they don't immediately go back to work. They may have to do other treatments, other treatments. And that means that it delays their return to work and that costs money because they're not productive, they're not getting the, the, the salary they want, and, and uh, um, it costs money also for the treatments. So you want to reduce the situation uh, as much as possible. And then the iteration also means that that uh, uh, secondary treatment was not the right one. Uh, it's another one that was have been, would have been better, and so forth. So there are mistakes. Mistakes result in these long iterations. So the idea is to uh, learn what is the best treatment, what program, they call program, the best program to give after a particular evaluation, and after a particular injury and a particular treatment in the beginning. And uh, so we can use yeah, all that stuff. So there are some, as I said, some long uh, uh, episodes and some short ones, and we want to we want these short ones. That means that that treatment was the right one. If we do the evaluation, oh, everything is fine. Go back to work. That's fantastic. We want these. Okay. So we can take the uh, from uh, the short ones like this, and we learn a model from the questionnaire. So what do we learn? We look at the data from the, the evaluator has a questionnaire to fill in. They ask questions to the patient, and they, this is yes, this is no, this is yes, this is no. And based on that, there is a treatment. So we use that to learn what treatment to give in what condition. Okay. And uh, so that's the classifier, that the cloud that you can see all the time. And now um, when we have a new patient, and we give a treatment, and then they come for the evaluation. The evaluator has a laptop. Actually, they don't have a laptop, it's a tablet. And the program is very small, it works on a tablet. They fill in that form on an uh, electronic uh, form, and immediately have a decision support system that says, oh, I recommend this program. Okay. And it happens that that program is the best indeed. Uh, the system, you can also ask it, why do you recommend this program, and it'll tell you what is in the conditions and the, and the form that justified that decision. Um, so you can see here, this is nothing related to genes, gene expressions. Here's another example that I love very much. Um, this is the case of uh, um, brain surgery. Somebody's in surgery here too? Uh, the two of us, yeah. Okay. So this is surgery for um, uh, brain cancer. Um, they, uh, before the surgery, or even when they do bombardments also with x-ray to kill the, the, the cancer cells, uh, they need to segment the area. Okay. Here's the, where's the, the, uh, the tumor basically, this is where I have to cut or this is where I have to bombard. What they do in order to minimize the return of the, the cancer, 
they also cut I don't know, half a centimeter or one centimeter all around. So these are healthy cells that they sacrifice to reduce the probability that it comes back. And healthy cells, it means actually you, you uh, jeopardize also some function from the brain. Uh, you don't want to do that. But so um, anyways, uh, uh, that's another, another project where we try to predict where it's, at, it's going to pro progress. The point is, is that before the surgery, the doctor does a segmentation of the medical image. Okay? Actually, it's in volume, so you have slices, and they do the segmentation. And it takes a long time to do the segmentation. And the segmentation is not perfect because the same doctor doing it in the morning and doing it in the afternoon, they may have slight differences. You, you ask two different doctors, they have a slight differences in the segmentation. So very tedious job. And it takes about half an hour. Half an hour is a long time. Okay. So the idea here is to take all the segmentations that were done in the past and learn a model to do it automatically. And it's not to replace the doctor, because the doctor knows exactly how to do the segmentation, but it's to start the work so that the doctor, rather than segmenting the whole thing, they start with something that is already segmented, they adjust it here, adjust it here, adjust it here, and it takes five minutes instead of 30 minutes. So here again, I'm not using any gene expressions or anything, I'm using images and past segmentations and learn from that. Um, oh yeah, this is another example. Um, the, this is uh, using a functional MRI, fMRI, and the idea is to be able to distinguish between people who have um, depression and people who are bipolar or have bipolar disorder. Outside, the symptoms are the same. But the disease is completely different. What we call depression and disease. Um, so, when we don't treat depression the same way we treat bipolar disorder. Um, so, the, the, the idea is to automatically distinguish the two cases using fMRI uh, images. Um, I won't go into the details, but then you understand the purpose. Uh, so, we already have results to distinguish between normal cases and ADHD, uh, and it works very well. Uh, now we are working on uh, really distinguishing between depression and bipolar uh, disease, and, and, and here the point is that we're not using all the other data that I told you about, and certainly not uh, SNPs or um, gene expressions, just medical images. Okay, so that's the part that I wanted to do on Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> The goal was to show you that uh, AI is transformative, uh, transformative technology that will transform healthcare for sure in a, in a big way. But it's not uh, uh, just the silver bullet that solves everything. There are many challenges that we still have to deal with. Um, and uh, uh, machine learning is a key, a key component of precision health. Any questions before I move to something? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm sure you're convinced that this is very helpful and useful for society and medicine in general. Um, <clears throat> I showed you many examples, but many, many people are alarmed by AI, saying, "Oh my gosh, this is actually a problem because uh, they're replacing all our jobs," and uh, especially when you read. Uh, articles that talk about the fact that machines can do better than dermatologists to identify uh, melanoma. Uh, machines can do better to identify whatever uh, disease using these medical images. So we don't need radiologists, we don't need dermatologists, and of course people are scared, but it's not, it's not true. It's, uh, uh, I think it's paranoia. Uh, what, but what it tells us is that the job of the radiologist will change, like it changed in the past. Medicine has never uh, stayed still, it evolves all the time. Uh, you can't compare medicine today and medicine 200 years ago. You have amazing tools that we didn't have 200 years ago. Uh, do you know that the, when the microscope was invented, it took half a century to get accepted? Uh, people were not using it. Now you can't imagine doing medicine without that microscope to look at the, especially pathologists. <laughs> 
Um, so the same phenomenon is happening also with AI. We have a new amazing tool. It'll take a while. There's always resistance. But uh, I hope that this new generation, uh, you are convinced that uh, it's very useful. So people are alarmed not just in medicine, they're alarmed everywhere. They're saying, well, uh, all these jobs will disappear and will be replaced wherever there's automation. Uh, actually, uh, some people have been talking about uh, existential threat. Okay. This is what I'll bring up in the next uh, part. Okay. So before I do that, I, I want to scare you a little bit and then show you how uh, some of the technology that exists today can uh, help even more medicine. Um, how will this scare you? Um, who buys online? Yeah, everybody buys online. Okay? So, uh, when you buy online, you go to an e-commerce site and you buy stuff. They keep track of you. And they learn more about you. Why do they want to learn more about you? Because they want to know what product you you will buy in the future and they will entice you to buy it from them because they want to make money. Okay. So the more they know about you, the better. So there's this notion of the DNA of the customer. Okay. Here's the DNA of the customer. And when you go to a website, so this is hypothetical, I'm going to show you this, uh, I go to a website that sells stuff and I will register because they need to know me and they need to know where to send the, the stuff that I buy. And I need to give them my address. So there's a form I fill in. I'll say, well, yeah, I'm a professor. I live in Edmonton. This is my name. This is my phone number. Uh, male. I'm 55 years old. I'm born in Germany. Whatever. They ask me different things. Some things I hesitate. So they give them, why do you want, do you want to know that? But I will end up giving them that. And I'll say, well, that's all they know about me anyways. I voluntarily gave them that information. But then I'm active in that website. Okay, so I buy things, I buy a watch, it's a waterproof watch, and then I buy goggles. Uh oh, there's a relationship between these two. Somebody who swims. Okay, and then I buy helmets. Oh, maybe doing triathlon or something like that. So they learn more about me. And I didn't say that here. But because I bought them, it, it says something. Uh, and I may add noise. For example, here I bought an espresso machine. I don't drink coffee, but they will think I drink coffee. I just bought it because I'm going to give it as a gift for a wedding or something like that. So there are things that are true, some, some things that are wrong. But overall, they learn about me. Um, it doesn't stop at activities that I have on the website. I have also all the behaviors. For example, I can go and search on their website for products. I didn't buy them, but I searched for them. And there's a meaning behind that. I search about home improvements. Oh, maybe. He moved to a new house or something like that. Um, I also do reviews of products. I say whether I like them, I didn't like them, uh, about books, about products I bought. And also I have friends on the website. Let's imagine in this e-commerce site, uh, we have friends and we, we talk to each other and stuff like that. What my friends like, we are friends. Probably I also like them. Okay? So there's that relationship that exists. And it doesn't stop there. They may go to the website, to the web search engine, and they search about me automatically. They'll find about my hobbies, where I work, uh, where I go. Uh, um, so Facebook will tell them my other friends and what my other friends like. Um, my Twitter, what do I tweet about? Um, LinkedIn, who are my colleagues? Where did I work before? Um, Foursquare, so I, do you know what's Foursquare? And so people have this app and they say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, so that their friends, if they're there, they can meet physically and uh, I don't know why people do that, but it exists that people do that. So if they do it, then uh, I can have the geolocation where these people went. Um, we can even do all the searches to find all the documents about these people, for example, um, Flickr, YouTube, my channels, the images that I put on, on the Flickr, um, even the the pages that I edited in Wikipedia. You know, within Wikipedia you can edit, so you can, oh, he's more interested in these uh, uh, political things or religious things or sports things or whatever, so they learn about me. Um, the news that I write about or even what I read, blog, my blogs, and because they can see the text that I write, they can also do what we call um, uh, emotion mining, and they can detect my emotions when I'm writing. Uh, was I happy? Was I angry? 
was I surprised, all that information, they keep track of that by time. So they know more about my emotions than I will remember. Do you remember when you were angry last time? No, they will. <laughs> um, is that scary? So that's the DNA of a customer. They know a lot about you. Well, we could do the same. Why is it done? Is it, it's done because these companies have the means. It's, there's a huge return on investment. Because when they invest money to do this stuff, they know you better, and there's a high probability to buy the stuff that I tell you about. Because I will target you with the things that I think you will buy, rather than targeting you with things that you will not buy. I'm wasting my time and my money. Okay. Um, so we can do that also in health. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, 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 companies that are interested in this, it's the government, the society that should be interested in this. So nobody's investing in the same way in this kind of thing. But imagine I have the DNA of the patient. Well, the same thing. I, in the beginning, I have some generic data. The gender of the patient, the name, the age, ethnicity, all that stuff that I could get from what, from what I go and visit the doctor, I go and visit to, when I go to the hospital. But afterwards, I have also historical data. My previous uh, cases when I was treated, so it's not necessarily uh, EHR and EMR, uh, it's often in, on paper unfortunately, so we have to convert it somehow. Uh, <clears throat> but also I have the prescriptions, all the drugs that I took in the past. Uh, somewhere in the database, um, all the medical images, um, the lab results, blood tests, uh, urine tests, uh, whatever, you name it. Um, but I also have genetic uh, information. The microarray data, the SNPs, the metabolomic data, uh, microbial, um, all these analyses, well, they were put in a record somewhere, I have access to it, so I, uh, if I have access to it, I can put it in this uh, customer DNA. And I have other sources, I can also go uh, to these uh, 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 <coughs> electronic devices that are now very cheap and people have at home, they have on their watch, they can test their uh, blood also with, with these machines that are connected to the internet. Um, there are, uh, blood pressure, <coughs> um, also as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the what, smart watches, um, but people write stuff, so I could use the same technology to extract the emotions, and I have also mental health information. So if I was able to do this, and the technology exists since the e-commerce sites are doing it, the technology exists, if we focus to build this, can you imagine what kind of precision health we can have? It's like this precision advertisement. Now I have precision health. It'll change completely medicine. And we can do it. We just need the political will. <laughs> uh, also, the locations where people went, this is very important. There are papers to demonstrate that I can predict who's going to get the flu based on where they are. Okay, when there's an epidemic in the city, people have the flu, blah, blah, blah. I can see other people tweeting about, oh, I'm sick, I'm staying at home, or uh, I feel tired, or whatever. And then you are also tweeting, and you're very close to them in the same wagon and the same train. So that I can actually calculate the probability you get the flu. And people have done that. Okay. Yet, you have people like uh, Stephen Hawking, before he died, he passed away, he said that actually AI is a threat to humankind. Um, he didn't stick to that very long afterwards, actually. He realized, that, oh my gosh, I'm creating a uh, paranoia in the world. Yeah, he, because not only him, but people like Elon Musk and even Bill Gates said that. Uh, <clears throat> mind you, the only one who's close to AI is Bill Gates, close between quotes. None of them are specialists in AI. Yet they are talking about this big threat. Um, <clears throat> later, actually, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, gave a, a, a counterpunch. He said uh, that the biggest threat is not AI per se, it's actually how we will use it. So, uh, for example, the people who have the means, who, use, who will use AI to build these robots to automate everything, and people lose their jobs then it's the people who have the means to build these robots that will get all the benefit of that. And all those who don't have jobs will have nothing. Okay. So that will create kind of another revolution. Uh, people won't be happy. 
But that's the biggest threat, is actually the imbalance and the uh, distribution of wealth of the world. Ah, something to uh, think about. Okay. Um, if you look back in history, AI had amazing achievements, incredible achievements. Um, you remember Deep Blue in 1997, when uh, we uh, managed to beat Gary Kasparov in chess? That discussion about AI replacing everybody started already then. Okay. Nobody can beat a computer at chess today. Don't even think about it. Even on your small cell phone, we can be Gary Kasparov today. Remember I told you about the difference between the computers and the evolution and then our cell phone, where, where it fits in that. I mean, the cell phones are very powerful today. Um, checkers, same thing. So in 2007, we solved the game. That means you, you can demonstrate from the, from the beginning, you can prove whatever move you make, I'm going to win. I know that you're going to win because the, the whole, all the possibilities have been solved. And this was done at uh, U of A. Um, <clears throat> in 2011, um, they started talking about, yeah, computers win already uh, humankind because um, the uh, program um, Watson from IBM um, beats the best of the best at the Jeopardy game. I don't know if I will have slides next time. I'll talk about how does it work actually inside. When you when you open the box, you realize actually there's no magic in there. It's, that's not what will uh, uh, jeopardize humankind. Uh, but the interesting thing is in 2011, after this win by uh, IBM Watson, this is when people started talking about. Well, people people were, start, were talking about it before, but this became very general. They were talking about the singularity. Have we covered singularity yet or not yet? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is where people started seriously considering the technological singularity. Um, and I'll get back to that here and later. Um, here at U of A, we also solved the, um, oh, here, the uh, heads up um, limit Texas Hold'em poker uh, version. Uh, and even with the no limit, now we beat the professional poker players. So these are games that are very, very difficult. And poker is very different also from the other games because in the case of poker, um, you don't have the information in front of you. When you play chess, all the information is on the board. You can see them. But in poker, it's hidden. So there are many uncertainties. It's a way more complex kind of uh, problem, yet we, we, we solved it in 2014. Um, also, the self-driving cars. These are all impressive uh, achievements by AI. What comes next? I forgot. Oh yeah, here's uh, another incredible achievement that came uh, a few years ago. Do you know about the Go game? Have you heard of the Go? Okay, this changed everything as well uh, in many parts of the world. So the Go game is a board game like this. So you have um, <coughs> A big grid, and you have two colors, and it's, a, it's the idea is to win territories. Okay, um, it's very, very, very popular in Asia, particularly in China, in Korea, in Japan, um, in, in North America. We call it the Go game, and it's a very tough game not to play. Anybody can play the Go game, and kids can play it. Kids actually start very early playing the Go game. But it's very tough for computers to beat humans. And for a very long time, even though we, we solved checkers and we beat Gary Kasparov in chess and any human, uh, we were not able to beat a nine-year-old kid playing Go against the computer. Because the search space to look at the possibilities is too big. It's bigger than the size of the universe. Um, yet people were trying to build these programs, and one of them was Martin Miller, a specialist here at U of A, he's a specialist in the, uh, the field, subfield in, in AI called search. So when you have a search space, how do you prune it and, and search efficiently in there? We call it heuristic. He, he, has, he comes up with heuristics to do these searches, so we call it heuristic search. And there's a student from Australia, David Silver, who was very interested in the goal. So he came to U of A to do his PhD with uh, Martin Miller and Rich Sutton. 
Remember I mentioned Rich Sutton, he's a specialist in reinforcement learning. So he's saying, well, how can we use reinforcement learning also to build a program that learns how to play Go? And after his PhD, he actually had a program that was able to beat master players at Go. Well, not the best in the world, but well, that was amazing, already from nine-year-old to... And when he finished his PhD, he was hired by a small startup company in London called DeepMind. Have you heard of DeepMind? DeepMind didn't have any particular product to build and sell. They were just working on this uh, general intelligence. Okay? And we wanted to, they wanted to build a program, they still want to build a program, that is smart enough that it can solve all the other problems. So when they hired the David Suter, they said, well, work on something related to that and do what you are good at. And what he was good at is writing programs to play Go. So he started a project called AlphaGo. He was the, the leader of AlphaGo. And um, that's, when, uh, oops, that's when Google came and acquired DeepMind. So at the end of 2013, DeepMind was acquired by Google. And um, uh, Larry Page, in the beginning of 2014, in an interview, uh, the TED Talks, he admitted the reason why they bought this small startup in London for a lot of money was the fact that they were impressed by the program that they wrote at DeepMind that was able to play different games. So what is very specific about the AI achievements in the past is that the programs that they wrote were very specialized. So this program was for chess, beats the best in the world in chess, but that same program cannot be used for checkers or for poker or for driving a car or something else. It's very specialized. Same thing, you take the self-driving car, the program for the self-driving car cannot be used for something else. They're very, very specialized. Remember, we humans are very... We're not specialized. We, we can do many different things at the same time. Okay? I can give a lecture, I can cook a meal, I can drive a car, I can play chess, I can do all these things at the same time. So the fact that the program that they built was able to play better than humans in many different Atari games impressed these guys and said, well, that's why we wanted to use their technology. The interesting thing is that that program for playing different Atari games was also done at, oops, but also done at the University of Alberta. Our students were hired by that company that were doing it, <coughs> like um, what David Silver was doing there. But anyways, with the means that uh, uh, now Google has, the, the new parent of DeepMind, uh, they can push, they were able to push, uh, of, oops, where am I going? Uh, I'm going backwards, or yeah, backwards, sorry. Uh, problem here, double. So they were able to push the uh, AlphaGo project, and then they said, okay, well now we are ready to challenge the best in the world. And they invited uh, Lisa Dahl, who was eight times, I think, world champion in the world for uh, uh, <coughs> the game Go. And uh, everybody thought, oh, gee, this will be uh, fun to watch because Lisa Dahl will ridicule the computer uh, programmers, but actually it was the opposite. He lost, miserably lost, and actually recently he uh, uh, retired from the game completely. He said there's no hope to win the computer, so he retired. Um, <clears throat> but it was a shock worldwide, except the Chinese. Now they started paying attention. And they said, mm, yeah, he said, oh, not bad, but we have the best of the world. Um, so uh, Google challenged KG, um, and KG lost. And that, that was a big shock. And that's when the Chinese decided to invest billions of dollars in AI. And so it changed completely uh, how people uh, uh, look at AI. But it didn't stop there. So what Google did, said, yeah, OK, so this is just uh, for um, Go. It's very specialized. And uh, to get it to that point, the program was learning from all the games that existed. Because when the game happens, they, they, they record it. Okay? So all the moves and all that stuff, 
the problem was learning from these experts. They said, well, what if we just remove all that stuff? We teach the program how to play, just the rules, and let it play against itself. And it learns from its own experience. And indeed, after a while, it played enough games that actually it's way more than any game, uh, than all the games that humankind has played. Because okay, computers are fast. And then they challenged AlphaGo. This is, I have a new program called, called AlphaGo Zero. And AlphaGo Zero beat AlphaGo that beat the best in the world by a long shot. Um, so that was announced in 2017. <clears throat> so it learns more than what humankind has played for 3,000 years. Um, and that was done by training against itself for 40 days a month. They didn't stop there. They said, aha, that's cool. Let's remove the rules of Go and put the rules of chess. And let it play against itself at playing chess. Will it actually achieve something? Now, there's no need to challenge Gary Kasparov. He's still playing chess. Uh, but let's challenge the best program today that definitely beats Deep Blue that was done in 97. Let's challenge the best uh, chess program and see what it does. What, is, what do you think happened? Oops, why do I have to go again? Oops. Yeah, there it is. Um, <clears throat> so 20 years after Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, AlphaGo Zero, with rules of chess, was beating the best. So this is uh, Stockfish 28. Um, <clears throat> Uh, no, 28 is the number of uh, wins against zero in 100 uh, game matches, and they stopped. This was in December, so two years ago. Three years ago, two years ago. It didn't stop there. Then they took the same idea, and they said, okay, we'll teach it to play StarCraft. Uh, it's a strategic game. And um, they called it um, Alpha, uh, Alpha Star, and uh, Alpha Star uh, beats the best, or humans anyways, at the StarCraft game. Um, so now we do it. Because we have a program, you change the rules, it learns by playing against itself, we're doing it many, 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 many times, and it does better than human experts. Well, that's exaggerated. Don't worry, you still have your jobs. Okay, so uh, we achieved incredible things, um, Jeopardy, AlphaGo, and, and so forth. But we humans do other things that these programs can't do. You came here to the university. You probably did many tests and exams. And do you think a computer can pass, uh, for example, uh, a university entrance exam? 2020, we're already in 2020. Let's say by in two years, 2022. We can already do it. Actually, here at U of A, we developed a program that can pass the bar exam to become a lawyer, and to make it even more exciting, can pass the bar exam in Japan, in Japanese, without understanding Japanese. Um, <clears throat> So, oh yeah, I have this slide about uh, how Jeopardy more or less works. This is a very high level kind of description. But in Jeopardy, uh, you know the game Jeopardy. Okay? So I, I uh, give you a sentence. For example, Mozart Last Symphony shares its name with this planet. Okay? And then you have to answer with the question. Who is this or what is that? So here's the sentence. Mozart's Last Symphony uh, shares its name with this planet. You have to come up with a, with a question. What would be the question? Do you know the answer? So this is how Jeopardy, well, they, not Jeopardy, the, the, uh, uh, the program that IBM uh, did called Watson, how it does it. So here, the important thing is I have a planet, and I have Mozart, and I have symphony. So I extract some named entities that are important from here, and I simply go and um, a query 
my knowledge base, knowledge base we have is like, for example, the web. Uh, even though Watson is not connected to the web, there's a lot of databases that were already preloaded. So I will query with Mozart and Last Symphony. Okay. I still have Planet. I'm not going to search with Planet. I'll just take Mozart, Last Symphony. What are, what are the symphonies of Mozart? And then I get a web page like this. Okay. This is an example with Google. It can be any, any search engine. Okay. And then I will choose one of them. So yeah, you see here, symphony number 41, Mozart, and it's a Wikipedia page. Okay. Then I extract it. Here's the Wikipedia page of symphony number 41, Mozart. And in there, uh, I will read the page. I think the computer reads and understands. No, not on humans. So we'll actually look for the terms that were in my query. Here I have symphony, I have Mozart, I have symphony, Mozart, symphony, Mozart, Mozart, last. Okay. These are where words in my query. And then I will find words close to these highlighted words that are also names of, remember I was looking for planet. Okay. So I will query for all my planets and I will look around this. Is there a planet that is named there? And indeed, so I get that from another page. I have all the planets. And then I will find that one of them, Jupiter, is here. So the answer is, what is Jupiter? Do I, have, oh, I, don't have the, I don't have the page. But the answer would be, what is Jupiter? And that happens in a fraction of a second. Okay. Is there intelligence in there? Actually, the intelligence is in the methodology that they did. And the methodology was a human who did it, not the computer. But from the outside, it looks impressive. Because in a fraction of a second, it knows Jupiter. Did you know the answer was Jupiter? No. Okay. So we can do it also with uh, multiple choice. Uh, we can do it also with true false uh, questions. Um, like this is here, um, true false is Charlemagne uh, repelled by the Magyars. So then you can transform the question uh, and the true false into uh, um, factoids or facts. And you can extract information, and you can uh, you can get different probabilities for different uh, uh, possibilities. And you can see Magyar is less than the Avar, so you will say no for that question. But again, it may look very smart, it's very knowledgeable, but it's all done with tricks like that. Okay, uh, I'm trying to remember my slides. Yeah, so this, this uh, question about uh, computers are um, uh, existential threat is uh, very serious and many people take it very, serious, uh, very seriously and uh, there are many uh, organizations that are um, thinking about what to do about it and uh, uh, what are the issues, but we are way, way, way behind. I mean, the, the intelligence you have in computers, I mean, I'm working on it daily. I see that there is progress, but I also know that we're way behind this uh, uh, specific date when we will have a machine that is smarter than us. I mean, in 2011, uh, the Time magazine had in the front page uh, an announcement, a prediction for a date. And I think they say by 2030 or 2040. 2045. 2045. Yeah. We will have a machine that is smarter than you. That's 25 years from now. I don't believe it is possible. But some people do believe that, and I may be wrong. Um, but I believe that it will happen one day. Uh, when? We will know. I, I don't know. It will happen one day. And because it will happen one day, we should consider it. But I don't think it's... We should look at it as a threat. We should have. We should look at it uh, so that and, and think about possibilities to make it actually in our advantage, not in our disadvantage. And how we can uh, work with that. Um, and also, uh, I'll have a slide about that. I, I, I don't necessarily believe that we will reach it by making a machine smarter than us. I think we'll reach it by merging with machines. Skip this. Um, so is it paranoia or is it reality? I think it is reality, um, but uh, not as threatening as these people are saying, and we have to work with that. Um, and this is not new. 
it's not just after 2011 that people started thinking about that. Um, a long time ago, people have uh, I mean, suggested that. Uh, uh, this is just uh, ironic. I showed you this example before. How can a, a machine become smarter than us when they can't even distinguish between <laughs> muffins and dogs? So you see, uh, Ray Solomonov um, already warned us in the 60s um, that um, there is a possibility that we'll have very intelligent machines uh, and it's a, it's a good thing to start devoting energy and time to think about it, what to do about it now rather than waiting till it happens and then say, oh, what do we do? Okay. When it happens, it's too late. So it's not new. Um, so what is the technical uh, singularity, technological singularity, is the day that a machine will be smarter than humans. Why do we call it a singularity? It's because when that happens, the machines are those that will be uh, uh, running innovation and, and, and be innovators. Now, we don't have to do it anymore. They will do it for us, and it will be recursive. So as soon as the become more intelligent, they will actually uh, think about how to do it even more intelligent and so forth and we can't uh, keep up and uh, we will not be able to actually predict what will happen. Uh, and that's why we call it a singularity. Um, now, why do I believe it can happen? I, can, I believe that it can happen because um, for me I find it's logical. Why is it logical? Well, uh, imagine the, this path here, this railway, is the progress. It's, an, it's a metaphor of progress. And it shows the intelligence. So machines, artificial intelligence, are not that intelligent. They're still behind. Okay? And we are here, human intelligence. We agree that we are way more intelligent than machines. Okay? There are some animals that are intelligent. You have a dog or a cat. or They're smart, aren't they? Uh, mice are smart. Animals are smart in general. So, but they're, I believe, more intelligent than, than AI today. But certainly less intelligent than us. Okay. So AI is improving. It's not just there, it's improving. Okay. Eventually it will be more intelligent than animals. And why should it stop there? Okay. If it reaches us, it can go beyond. So. It's logical. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the thing is that we differ from machines quite a bit. We have instincts, we have emotions, we have. Uh, uh, we are also very inconsistent. The way we do things, uh, machines are very consistent. They don't have emotions. They don't have instinct. Uh, but can we program it? Can we simulate it? I don't know. I work on uh, actually expressing emotions by machines and recognizing emotions. Um, we're not that bad. <laughs> okay, so here's another point I wanted to make. These are very simplistic kind of uh, metaphors, but uh, I, I think they, they illustrate the idea. A mouse. A mouse looks at the world and uh, it's looking for food to survive. Okay? It's reproducing for the, uh, the survival of the species. Um, now I'm hungry, I'm a mouse, there's food on the other side of the river. I will adapt to that. I will just cross the river. I'll swim. Okay? I need to eat. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how to milk the cow and make cheese, but I love cheese when I find it. Hey, I'll adapt to my food. That food is not a natural food for a mouse. It loves cheese. It'll eat it. Survive with it. Um, <clears throat> if I'm in a field to build a nest, I will find the natural things there to build my nest. But if I'm in a garage, I will adapt to the garage. I'll find the paper, the cardboard, the electric cables, whatever I find to build my nest. Okay, so that animal is quite smart. It adapts to the world. If I put a mouse in a, in a maze, it'll find its way and it'll learn that maze. And if I put it again in that same maze, it'll find its path very quickly. So it has a way of memorizing and, and reason about 
it reasons about that that maze. Um, it has then been demonstrated that actually a mouse knows how to do simple calculations too. One plus one is two. I have I'm moving my babies from one place to another. I know if I have some left there or not, and things like that. Okay. But do you think the mouse, looking at the stars, understands what the stars are? Now we know what the stars are. Uh, at least now. They're not just holes and there's light coming through. Um, I don't know what the mouse thinks, but certainly the mouse is not thinking about another planet where mice may exist or not. Okay? Um, and when the mouse is eating the cheese, the mouse doesn't even imagine that there are proteins there and how these proteins are folding and all that stuff. It's not thinking about it. Um, when the mouse goes to my garage and nests in my engine, it has no idea what that engine is for, that is to move this big thing. Uh, it knows that it's warm, so it's for its survival. Um, when it looks at this rocket going up, it doesn't think that it's going to another uh, space. Uh, it's just making a lot of noise and it's threatening. Uh, it has no idea what it is, and it certainly cannot do abstractions in math, even though it knows how to calculate. It cannot do any, any math. Any significant math. Okay. So compared to our brain, even though I just said it's an intelligent being, it's an intelligent um, um, thing, um, it's not as intelligent as us. So that means there's something intelligent, something less intelligent. If that is true, then I can put it on a scale. Okay. And the humans are intelligent. So these are sub-intelligent. Maybe a cockroach is even less intelligent than a mouse. Okay, so I can't have a scale. If that is true, um, what about the intelligence of the human? Is it really the maximum and there's nothing above it? Well, we can imagine something. If that's a zero and these are negative, I can have positive intelligence. So super intelligent, more intelligent than the human. So it's a possibility. We're not there yet, but it can happen. So we can't conceive, uh, uh, we can't conceivably think that a mouse could comprehend the, our degree of intelligence. The mouse doesn't know that we are more intelligent. It only knows that we are threatened. We can kill it. Okay? The mouse doesn't know what we know. Okay? In the same way, we may imagine something more intelligent than us, but we cannot comprehend the intelligence of that superintelligence. Any questions? So how do we get there? And, and for me, thinking about it, uh, there are many paths. It's not just a machine will be eventually more intelligent than us. There are many ways to get to something that is more intelligent than us. So one way is uh, waiting for biology. Evolution. Evolution will create some humans that are more intelligent than us. Then we can wait billions of years. Maybe it will happen. That's not 2045. <laughs> but people are trying to do things to help nature. Okay? It's not ethical. It's unethical. But people are doing it. It also will take a long time, a, long, I mean, a lot of efforts. I, I, I argue that if you take Aristotle so in the 4th century BC and bring him here in this century, uh, uh, <clears throat> there will be uh, the, the people who lived at that time they will be as intelligent as us because they will be learning things that we are learning that they didn't know uh, at that time. But their, that machine, the capacity of the machine here called the brain is the same. Okay. So it will take way longer time to make it uh, more intelligent. Well, that's a path. Another path is create an, a, a machine. Um, but, well, I didn't talk about it last time, but uh, I used to. There's a difference between hardware and software. So hard, our hardware is getting better and better and better and better. Okay? But the software is not catching up as fast. So we're way behind to make it, to make the machine uh, as intelligent as humans. But people believe that that's a possibility. I think so too, but it'll take very long time. Okay. The third path is when you merge the humans and the machines. So we'll have cyborgs. Um, 
And you may think, well, that's, that's science fiction, that's movies. Well, it's happening already. Okay. If I have the possibility to enhance my what nature gave me, I will become superior to what I used to be. Okay. Uh, I can do it with my hands, with my eyes, and so forth. Well, what about my brain? Uh, imagine I adding capacity to remember more things. We already have that. Your phone uh, is your, the extension of your memory. You don't remember the phone numbers of your friends because you ask your phone to call them directly. Uh, so that's one path, and um, there is a movement called the transhumanism movement, and, and people are not just believing that it's possible, they're already starting to do things that are phenomenal. I'll show you some examples. Now, the fourth path is coming from something else we didn't expect. So I probably mentioned last time the uh, uh, Internet Protocol version 6, maybe not. So. Um, the first version, well actually it's the fourth version, of uh, the Internet Protocol specifies the address for any, uh, the, the format of the address of any uh, device that is connected to the Internet. We didn't expect at that time that we'll have that many machines connected and we are reaching the limit. So there's a new version of the formatting of the address called IP version 6 that now allows billions and billions of objects to be connected to the Internet. And that means now we can connect to many things. And we call it the Internet of Things. So the computer can be connected to the Internet, but also the light bulb can be connected to the Internet. The uh, thermostat can be connected to the Internet. Your shoes can be connected to the Internet. Your clothes, or the wearables you have, whatever, anything can be connected. And then you have this incredible network of things. And something can come out of it that we don't expect. Why am I thinking that? And I, I'm doing the analogy with, I don't know if I have the video here, um, what is happening with ants? Um, oh, there is a video. Okay. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This so sentence you have to is grammatically correct, uh, but it's wordy and hard to read. It undermines oh, the writer. Look at this for a few minutes. So the idea here is that if you take one ant, you can't imagine that one ant can architect this whole thing and plan for fungus gardens. They have aphids that they feed to get something out of them. Um, they have all these paths. These, it's, it's phenomenal. And one ant cannot think about that. So it's the collective together. People are still not understanding how it happens. People think, well, it's evolution, it's in their chromosomes, and whatever. I mean, you can hypothesize many things. But many other people are actually thinking there's the fact that they're working together, some kind of intelligence comes out of it. So when you have all these things connected, who knows, maybe there's an intelligence that will come up. And uh, maybe that could be threatening because they have control over everything. So anyways, these are three paths. The one that I really believe in is number three, will be the fastest, because it's already happening. Okay. You know, this picture, this is Captain Picard when he was uh, abducted by the Borgs and uh, assimilated. Uh, he was mixed with, so the Borgs are mixed. It's, a, uh, it's in the science fiction uh, Star Trek. Um, it's, a, it's a race, mixed uh, humanoids and machines. Um, and they live in actually in a colony where they're all interconnected. Uh, <clears throat> but these are machines and humans mixed together, and they exist already among us. We already have people with uh, artificial limbs, artificial uh, hips and, and, and knees, and um, artificial eyes, and so they exist already, they're here. Uh, and it's not just mixing humans with machines, you can also mix machines with biological cells, and that happened already. So there is a, a famous project that was done where they have these small robots, they call them uh, rats, they're robot rats, they all look the same, cookie cutters, but they're controlled by cells of rats, that's why they call them the rats, because they take the brain cells of rats, and the rat cells 
are controlling the turning left and turning right. And but the interesting thing is that these cells that are on a <coughs> small dish that is controlling the computer and remotely the, the, the computer controls that uh, uh, rat robot, these cells die. So they replace them with new cells. And the behavior of that robot changes. It's not the same. So even though they look like cookie cutters, they have different personalities, which is quite quite interesting. So these science fiction movies like the Six Million Dollar Man or the Bionic Woman, we're getting there. It's not far-fetched. Okay. Of course, uh, actually often these science fiction movies, they, they look like far-fetched, but they have an amazing prediction of what we can do. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they're exaggerated in there. This idea of uh, uh, science fiction and, and computers uh, taking over is not new. Um, this is a movie from 1969, Colossus, and they were talking about um, a Russian computer and an American computer uh, uh, collaborating to take over the world. So uh, even the old, old movies were already talking about the danger of these computers. But here are examples to show you that this marriage but between computers and, um, and humans, well, machines and biological entities, uh, is going to happen. Uh, and uh, we will choose to do it. Uh, this is an example of uh, research done to allow blind people to see again. So this is people who used to see before, but for different reasons, uh, the retinal degeneration, they don't see anymore. So they took the same idea as cochlear implants for hearing, where you have a microphone, transform the sound, and the sound becomes a mechanical kind of uh, a hammer hitting on the bone to simulate the sound, and you can hear it, somebody who is deaf can hear. And this is a very old technology, more than 100 years old. The cochlear implants existed for a long time. They use the same idea here, but you have cameras that are put on, a, on glasses, so you can normal glass, and we have these cameras. The cameras communicate with a chip that has been put on top of the retina. And this chip is exciting the nerves of the retina to make you believe you see something. So then the message is sent through the optical nerve to the brain, and the brain sees something. The images, the early images that they had, they were 4 by 4 pixels. 16 by 16, now 32 by 32. So somebody was blind, and then suddenly now they see an image. Okay. Like this, which is not, not bad at all. But the picture like this, 32 by 32, and is only a gray scale. It's like the very early digital cameras. Look at the cameras today. And one day, that implant there will allow a person to see like the amazing digital cameras. So they will be able to see also at night with infrared. They will be able to zoom in, zoom out. Can you do that? You can't. So maybe some of us will choose to lose the eyes we have and put these eyes. And this is how it looks on the retina. Uh, there are different companies. This is another company in, in, uh, in Australia that does similar things. but. With different ways of uh, exciting the cells. Um, yeah, I have other pictures I wanted to show you. So here's here's one one uh, thing that may convince you. Um, this is a picture taken in 2011. So long time ago already. It was taken in Vancouver. You recognize here the CBC logo. This was in Vancouver during the Stanley Cup Finals, and uh, they were predicting that probably the Canucks will lose, and it will be a riot and all that stuff on the streets. So they had cameras in many places taking pictures. Okay. Not everybody could get in the stadium, so they had big screens showing the game live so that people on the street can watch it. So what do you see here? You see a huge crowd. And indeed, after the game, there was a riot, and people bro uh, broke windows of uh, stores, and, and the police was asking people to can you volunteer the pictures that you took so you can identify the criminals? They didn't need that. Because they didn't want to tell you that they already placed these cameras in many places. And uh, they can look at this person here. Can you see this person here? Well, that person thinks he's hidden in the crowd. Well, 
that camera was taking a picture with 2100 megapixels. It's not that with 2 megapixels or 4 megapixels. This is 2011. So that person here, actually, I can see it here. I'm zooming in. Can you see that person now? Not really. Well, I can keep on zooming in. You see that person now? So from here, I can see that. So imagine if you had that technology from 2011, but in your eye. And you are able now to zoom in. Would you choose that bionicle eye? This is nine years ago. If you were using the technology of um, the cameras today, because that's not a normal camera, um, and you zoom, zoomed in here, this is what you will see. I mean, if you had, uh, if you took this picture with a normal camera, this is what you would see. So here is another example, uh, phenomenal zoom. Okay, this is in Shanghai. This is a, a company that came up with a camera that has. 195 billion pixels and it's like an eagle it's better than an eagle now I can read the newspaper 200 meters away can you so that is true for the eye but imagine also that your arm can do things that you can't do now I can turn my hand 360 degrees, so I don't need a screwdriver to turn things, and whoosh, that'll do it. Okay? Or I can lift something that is very heavy without any effort. Why wouldn't I change my limb and put something else? So it will happen, and same thing, it's not just the eye or the arm or whatever, it can be also with the brain. And there are companies now working on creating interfaces with the brain. Um, so this is what we call body hacking. Body hacking exists already. These are people, because we don't have any legislation, no rules, no. People try things on themselves. Um, you've probably heard of this RFID that you can put in your hand or in your ears and you, it can identify you. People are actually talking about having a passport like this, okay, inside here. Uh, so people have done it on their own so that they can open the, their door at home or so their place is the key, or they can pay on a, on a distributor for food. Um, but people do other things, crazy things. These are kids, teenagers, who actually uh, open their skin here, they put LED lights underneath that turn on when they are close to a hotspot. So as they walk and they look for Wi-Fi connections, and there's a hotspot, their, their hands will light up. Uh, yeah, yeah, they do it. <laughs> People do all sorts of things. There's another example. This guy actually put underneath his skin a hard drive to store the information that his uh, uh, wearable um, devices are capturing, the camera or whatever. So it's connected directly here, and it's in his arm. Um, people try all sorts of things. This is a, a less intrusive. This is actually printed, a printed sensor that you can print, and it's been, it can wash away. You can print it again. Um, so people tat also put tattoos, there are LED tattoos today, so they are benign, but uh, this is done by amateurs, they're not professionals. Um, what the professionals are doing behind the scene is unbelievable. Okay. Again, I, I don't know what the time is, what time is it? It's 3.16. Oh, I should stop. I'll stop <laughs> here and I'll open it for questions. Right. Well, you're still okay. shocked. Okay, any questions? So, did you imagine the singularity to be that way, going to the singularity of that path? Do you believe it's possible? Okay, I've convinced you, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> because it's happening already now. So, using DNA to find out more about a person, a lot of, like, there's hereditary companies that, you know, you can send your DNA off to and they'll tell you where you're, you originated from? Yes. A lot of people are skeptical of that yes. because, especially like in the states where insurance is privatized, like yes. they're afraid that insurance companies will use that against them. Is that a, like a good reason to be skeptical or not? Yes. So, 
there are many companies doing that, and uh, they give you two different things. One is about your origin, where you come from, which uh, country, and stuff like that. And the other piece of information they give you is your probability to get this disease, or that disease, or that disease. Um, and it's becoming very, very cheap compared to what it used to cost. So many people do it. And you don't have to send uh, something, a piece of your finger or whatever. You just have to spit in something and give it that. So it's easy, it's affordable, and people do it. Um, for them, what they get out of it is these two, two pieces of information. But you have no clue what you signed in that very big document. Um, and it, it was uh, uh, admitted later uh, that actually these companies are sharing their information with other companies, whether it's Big Pharma or whatever. And um, the problem is that we have no idea what they're doing with it. It's not just a question of insurance companies. I don't know, what about governments? Or whatever. We have no idea. Uh, but if you do this, and I thought about doing it in the beginning, and then immediately I said no, uh, you think you, you're getting, it's benign, you get only these two pieces of information. And if you pay actually more, they will update the medical information regularly, because we have new discoveries, uh, relationships between some genes and some diseases, and or treatments and prognosis or whatever. So uh, they give you updates. Uh, if you don't, don't pay that, then you get it only once. But you think that's what you, they did with it and they dump it. They don't dump it, they put it in a database and they do many things with it. Is it beneficial to you? Maybe. Is it detrimental? Maybe. We don't know. As long as they're not clear about it, uh, I'm skeptical. Any other question? <laughs> Watch the movie Gattaca. It's an interesting movie. So Gattaca is a, a, a movie about a person who's taking the place of another person. Uh, a person who, so it's in a society where all the privileges, whether it's a job or whatever, are based on the probability that you will get sick or you, who you are basically genetically. Um, and it's a very interesting movie. I think it came in 97 or 98. Uh, but it, it shows a possible society <laughs> using that kind of information that is collected by these companies that you're talking about. Maybe it's a little bit paranoia, paranoia, but it's a possibility. And if we don't think about them, they happen suddenly because we didn't think about that possibility. It's better to think about that possibility and collectively avoid it. I guess on the uh, topic of movies and stuff, um, what, I guess, work of fiction do you think portrays our future the most likely? I don't know what the future will be. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is the most plausible? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I would not be able to answer that question because nobody has ever be, uh, has, has, uh, uh, been able to predict the future. And whenever we try to predict the future, when we get to that future, we realize it was completely bogus. So the uh, Star Trek future, we don't know that it's similar to the real future, but it's a kind of benign society. So, yeah. so it has some, some advantages. Uh, yes, I know. Even though I like Star Trek, yeah. um, I think they exaggerate on many things. Yeah. Uh, and also, if you look at the original Star Trek, when you watch it today, you laugh. Because even the buttons and how the electronics right. are, they got it completely wrong. Completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard to predict. Um, on some fronts we go faster than we think, and some other fronts we are very slow uh, than what we expect to be. So it's hard. It can be different, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, in, in 2010, Ray Kurzweil predicted what 2020 would be like. Look at it today. And there are articles today on both sides. People say, hey, look, he was 90% right, or well, look, he was crazily wrong. wrong. You know? It all depends upon the parameters that you, you think are most important. So the, the, the best thing to do is to think what are 
the things we don't want, what are the things that we want, and work towards the things that we want, and start avoiding those that we don't want. But if we dismiss what could be wrong, it may surprise us and may happen, and we don't want it. So I think one, one way to think about it is that we may feel completely powerless in this course. On the other hand, we may think that some science fiction movie has it just exactly right. Whereas I think the, the, the fact is, is the opposite. There's no movie that has it just exactly right. And by talking about these things in this course, we can really prepare ourselves for the future and help shape the future in a positive way. So you have more agency than you think you do, and there's less to learn from science fiction movies than you think. So anyway, that's just my... Let's create our own science fiction. Yes. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay, don't go and do these things. <laughs> yeah, but we, we have somebody teaching in the course who does do this kind of thing, so you'll get to uh, uh, debate with him. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind this, and actually some companies are, are, are asking all their employees to do it. Um, and they don't force them, but they tell them, well, if you, you want to carry a key, uh, we'll do that for you. And then they have these machines where you can get uh, food. Uh, and if you don't have that in your skin, then you can't operate that machine, and it doesn't work with coins either. Uh, so people end up doing it. Um, um, if if uh, you have a city that tells you, well, if you have that in there, then you can ride the train and the bus for free, because that's how you identify yourself, well, you end up doing it. And it's benign enough that you don't feel it, you don't, uh, it's not rejected by the body. That's why they put it either in the ears, or maybe here, because you can move your hand. But the others, I don't know, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but there are also other negative things. So imagine now passports, physical passports are gone. So though some countries are now thinking about putting a passport in your phone. Okay. Uh, Netherlands is one of them. Canada is actually also doing some uh, 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 trials with that. So you don't have to carry, everybody has a phone, so you don't have to carry a passport identify yourself with the authentication that you do with your phone. But the phone can be lost, and so then it becomes a problem. And that's why instead of a phone, then you can have an RFID that identifies you uniquely. But also it can create other problems. Because you, some criminal, criminals may think about, okay, I will abduct you and cut this and take it and, and uh, cross the border on your right. behalf. Yeah. So anything has a positive and negative, and you have to think about uh, the plus and minus to avoid the side effects. So the world is changing so much, you know. 33 years years ago, I got an ID card, and I always thought if I lost it, I'd be in big trouble. And so I, it, when I was moving a whole bunch of things, I lost my ID card about eight months ago. And it took the ID office only about three minutes to reproduce the new card. The only question they had was whether I look like the picture on the card. They, 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 they didn't care about anything else. It's just, I claim to be Kim Solas, and if once they print out that card, if I didn't look like that, I would have been in deep trouble. But so I walked in, and, and you know, four minutes later, I was walking out with a new, new card. But by the way, this technology is not new. Yeah. It has been around for a very long time, um, from the 80s already. But they were not using it for the humans. They were using it for the animals. So in the 90s, um, many, many farms were using it with cows. They put the pedigree. Uh, when was the last time that uh, had a baby and, and uh, what food uh, uh, it eats every day and stuff like that. All that information is stored in the ear, so there's an earring kind of thing. Uh, and now we use it also with pets, and dogs, cats, and all so when the dog is lost, we know uh, who's the owner and, and where they live. And so, so sometimes I use this, sometimes I use just a tattoo or a chain, but that chip can hold way more information and it's inside it, it's not lost. Some militaries also are thinking about doing it with the soldiers. So the, the 
battlefield, you can recognize it. You can read it remotely. You can read it. So it's not a new technology. It has been around for a long time, but now it's very avoid I mean, affordable. Anybody can, can do it. Okay, under shock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, looking forward well, to you. Tuesday. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>